to start on time here, so we'll do it a little bit early, and that gives us a little extra time. So I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Sasha Goldstein. He did a whole day workshop on this yesterday, so if he talks really fast to squeeze it into 40 minutes, you'll have to forgive him. But um, I think he'll probably be more kind to you than that. But let's welcome Sasha. Thank you. All right. Um, hi. Welcome. Thank you for coming. Uh, indeed, there was a full day workshop yesterday, but the good thing is, even if you missed that, um, you can still do the labs. So when I'm done, you'll be able to find the labs uh, for like three or four different tracing uh, labs that you can do with the BPF, um, as well as some development labs where you can build your own tools. Um, so if this is interesting, then in about uh, an hour, you'll be able to experiment with it a little as well. Um, so I'm the CTO of a consulting company based in Israel, and uh, a lot of my work has been on performance and debugging. I'm a software engineer, that's my background. And um, this is an introduction to the, uh, to the next Linux superpower, which is BPF or extended BPF. Um, I'm going to focus specifically on the tracing aspect, so how you can use this to, for tracing to get better understanding of what the system is doing or what uh, the uh, applications are running are doing. But there's also uh, areas where BPF is used extensively for networking, for offloading, processing, for doing um, pre-dropping of packets before they get into the network stack. So there's a bunch of additional applications to this very same uh, technology. So uh, roughly the agenda is going to be a very quick overview of the tracing tools we have on Linux today and how BCC is a bit different. We'll talk briefly about BPF itself, the, the kernel technology, and we'll talk mostly about a front end which is called BCC, the BPF compiler collection. This is a front end that lets you build tracing tools in Python or Lua uh, with some bits in C. Uh, the C bits will be compiled and ran in the kernel and the, BP, the, the Python and Lua stuff is going to run in user space. Uh, we'll talk about using BCC tools, and I'll show you also a quick demo of authoring your own tracing tools built on this technology. So these are some of the Linux tools uh, for tracing that we have today. And uh, basically by tracing, I mean uh, finding a particular area in the system that you care about and getting some instrumentation information out of it. Um, function calls, uh, stack traces, argument values, uh, latencies, distributions, histograms, averages, uh, data basically that you can get out of the system dynamically, of course without having to recompile the whole thing, adding some flags, just dynamically on a running production system. So there's two axes here, ease of use and uh, level of uh, detail or uh, thoroughness that you can get out of the feature. Uh, out of the tool. Uh, so one example here is perf, which is, uh, you know, well respected and uh, a lot of you probably have seen. Uh, perf is smack down the middle. It has a lot of features. It uh, kind of tries to be the, the, you know, the Swiss Army knife tool for, um, uh, for tracing and for performance investigations on Linux in general. Um, and it's also rising, uh, in, my, in my opinion anyway, in terms of both features and ease of use. And then there's System Tap, for example, just another example. It's a very stable uh, tool set as well, um, which lets you write scripts that are compiled to kernel modules and run in the kernel to aggregate information, to collect stuff, uh, to collect data about what's happening on the system. And System Tap is kind of stable, but one interesting piece of information you might not have seen is that System Tap is now getting a BPF backend. So uh, instead of compiling down to C and the kernel module, uh, there will be a way to compile System Tap scripts down to BPF, to the BPF instruction set, which is what I'll be talking about. Um, and then BPF and BCC are kind of emerging. So right now, they're not super easy to use. Uh, there's also uh, very new kernel requirements. Some features only work on kernel 4.4 and higher, uh, 4.6 and higher. Uh, there's one thing I'll show you today that only works on 4.7. Um, so it's, uh, it's emerging and probably next year, uh, in a couple of years, uh, we'll all be using BPF tools, but right now it's still uh, kind of bleeding edge. Um, so just a quick intro to BPF itself. Uh, Berkeley packet filters, originally designed for, uh, well, filtering packets, right? Uh, but now BPF is used for a bunch of stuff that's totally unrelated uh, to filtering packets because essentially BPF is a little virtual machine that runs in your kernel and executes a custom instruction set. So you can, from user space, provide a program in this specific instruction set that the kernel will execute when it hits certain interesting paths. 
So again, originally just uh, dropping packets, uh, but today we can use BPF for a variety of additional tasks. The instruction set itself is uh, pretty simple. So you have like maybe 20, 30 instructions, uh, assembly-like, they're all uh, uh, the same size, but still, I guess you wouldn't want to write these programs by hand. Um, so of course there are tools that will take, for example, C code and produce uh, this BPF uh, bytecode. One nice thing about it is that even though it's a custom instruction set, uh, the kernel today can compile it down to native instructions. So there's essentially just-in-time compilation, kind of like uh, taking the Java bytecode and running it natively because you first translate it to machine code. So the same thing can happen with BPF programs as well. And another nice attribute is that Theoretically, anyway, uh, BPF programs are completely safe, so they can't crash your kernel, uh, they can't hang your kernel. Uh, the way we know they can't hang, for example, is that the program size is limited and there are no backward jumps. So you can only execute instructions going forward or jump forward. So you can't have an infinite loop or anything that delays you uh, indefinitely. And these are some very good properties, obviously, to have when you uh, let user space provide uh, instructions that would execute on the kernel, on a running production system. Um, and again, that's one of the pain points with uh, tools like SystemTap, where you just compile almost arbitrary C code and inject it into a live production system. So BPF has this safety guarantee there. So uh, as the expansion went, uh, BPF originally, again, appeared for packet filtering. Uh, in kernel 4.1, we can attach BPF programs to K probes and U probes. So basically, arbitrary kernel functions and arbitrary user space functions as well. Just whenever any function in the system runs, we can have a little BPF program execute and collect information. In 4.7, we have support for trace points, uh, kernel static trace points. Then one, that's one thing I'll be showing you a demo of. Um, the data structures that BPF programs can use have expanded a lot. So instead of just, uh, you know, being totally stateless and saying, drop this packet, don't drop this packet, you can now do aggregations, histograms, you have hash tables at your disposal. You can collect stack traces, so you can see what's calling a particular path in your kernel or in an application and uh, essentially do kind of profiling, if you will. Um, the output uh, syncs have expanded, so there's more ways to communicate with user space sufficiently, share buffers with user space of uh, trace information. And there's a bunch of helper functions that became available to BPF programs, so you have some context on the system. You know which process you're on, uh, which processor you're running on, what the current time is, so you can do latency calculations, for example, there's a bunch of scenarios enabled by having all these little helpers and uh, attach points for BPF. And BCC, as I mentioned, that's the front end that I'll be talking about. There's other front ends as well. Again, hopefully system tap and there's some other in development. But BCC is the one uh, uh, I'm going to focus on. So this is essentially a library uh, which is uh, built in C and C++. It has uh, C exports. And we have a wrapper on top of that in Python and Lua, which can be used to compile a BPF program, attach it to certain points in your kernel or in an application, run that program when interesting things happen, and back in user space, collect information for reporting, aggregation, display, alerting, whatever you want. So uh, again, BPF, BCC can compile BPF programs, attach them, and pull data. And uh, the APIs hopefully are kind of uh, relatively easy, although there's always room for improvement. We also have, in BCC, a very large collection of existing tools. If you don't want to write your own C and Python and Lua scripts, uh, you can use a pretty wide collection of tools. Some of these are work in progress, some are just uh, proofs of concept, but some are pretty fleshed out, and I'll show you a couple of examples. That's just a general, uh, uh, to give you a general idea of the stuff we have. And this is a diagram by Brendan Gregg. Uh, he has a lot of these for different Linux tracing technologies. So this is his diagram for, uh, for the BCC tools. Um, this is pretty familiar, right? All the different kernel components and subsystems. And there's also applications and syscalls and system libraries. Yeah. And everything you see here are uh, tools from that BCC front end that you can use today if your kernel is uh, new enough. 
so for example, on the file system side, we have tools for different file systems for getting latency distributions of file system operations. Uh, so, you know, reads, writes, syncs, and so on. Uh, we have tools for detecting slow operations above uh, a certain threshold. On the uh, scheduler side, we have tools for detecting when processes run on the CPU and when they get switched out. So uh, identifying processes that run for a very long time or uh, keep blocking and waiting for something. We have some generic tools for tracing uh, all system components, just basically tracing any kernel function or trace point. So there's a variety of uh, tools that you can use even if you don't want to build uh, your own. So I'm going to show you a few examples. Um, some of these are just going to be slides because I don't have a lot of time, but I do plan towards the end to build one tool uh, with you and show you the, uh, the end result. So one example, one very simple one, is hard IRQs. This is a tool uh, that displays hardware interrupt processing time and basically gives you a summary of each hardware interrupt and the total amount of time in microseconds that uh, the system took processing these hardware interrupts. So in this example, we don't have, uh, for example, network, but we have uh, uh, the disk. Um, we have BioLatency, which is a tool for block I.O. latency distributions. So this one, as you can see, gives you a nice ASCII histogram of uh, durations of uh, file system, of, sorry, block I.O. operations. So we had uh, a lot of them completing pretty quickly, but we also had one outlier over here, which took uh, anywhere between one and two milliseconds, right? So this is in microseconds here. And you can get these tools usually to report uh, in predefined intervals or just run until you hit control C and uh, get a report. Another cute example is file top. This is a BPF based tool that gives you the files being accessed on the system in a specified interval, kind of like top, but for files. So you see processes, you see how many reads and writes they did, you see the file names uh, that were accessed. You have cache stat, which gives you a report of file system cache utilization. Um, so how many hits, how many misses, read and writes satisfied by the cache and the cache size in megabytes. So we have cache stat that prints out this information. And just yesterday in the workshop, someone suggested we should also be giving uh, process statistics here. So which processes are uh, hitting the cache or missing the cache, right? So that's one obvious uh, extension, and it would be trivial uh, using BPF. One other example from the specialized tools um, is stack count. This is a little more low level. You give it a kernel function. And it gives you, over time, the call stacks, the stack traces, that call this kernel function frequently. So in this example, I had 14 calls to this function kmalloc, which allocates uh, kernel memory dynamically, from uh, iterate dir in uh, ext4. And we also had six from this uh, syspipe syscall. And we also had four. Uh, from here, from cloning, forking a process, and copying uh, some stuff around. Um, so you can see which code paths are leading up to a particular function. This is currently only for kernel functions, but uh, it's, uh, it, again, should be pretty easy to extend for user space functions as well. So if you have a, uh, a function in a library or an application or a database engine that you would like to trace in this way, it should be pretty simple too. Now, what are the tracing targets that we can attach to and the reason I'm talking about this is that we have general tools, generic tools, that work for all these different targets. So first we have k-probes and u-probes, which is like I mentioned, you can just attach to arbitrary functions in, uh, in the kernel or in any user space library or application. We have native support for that in the kernel, so BPF just has support for that. And we also have support for that in our front end, in BCC. Um, the overhead here is quite low for kernel probes because the BPF program also runs in the kernel. So there's no kernel to user space transition. Uh, basically, a K probe, when everything is optimized away, is just a jump. So you jump over to the BPF program, it runs, and it returns back to the original probed function. There's a trampoline as well, but it's really uh, not a very big deal in terms of overhead. For u-probes, on the other hand, we have a user space to kernel space transition and back every time you hit the probe because the function runs in user space, but the BPF program runs in the kernel. 
So that transition can make things a little more uh, expensive. Next, we have kernel trace points, which is just static instrumentation. So uh, you might know that the kernel has uh, over a thousand little uh, static trace points which emit interesting information. Uh, Perf can read those and BPF can read those as well. So we just recently got support in the kernel for attaching BPF to trace points. And just, uh, I think, 10 hours ago, we merged support for that in BCC as well. Um, and the overhead here, again, should be pretty low because the trace point is hit by kernel code and it calls a BPF program that also runs in the kernel, so no big deal. And finally, we have USDT trace points, uh, USDT support. Um, here, we don't have a very good story yet uh, for the, from the kernel side. So what we currently do in BCC is that uh, we just use uprobes. So we attach to different functions that would call uh, static trace points in user space and, and handle those. So again, here the overhead could be a little more considerable because the handler runs in the kernel and uh, the trace point itself is hit in user space. However, uh, there is someone working on a BPF engine for user space. So instead of having that little virtual machine and JIT compiler run in the kernel, you could hypothetically run the same thing in user space and do, again, aggregations, filtering, processing, whatever you want. Um, so that's work in progress, and that could reduce the overhead for user space tracing uh, with the same tools. Of course, the system interfaces will change, but maybe we'll be able to retain the same, uh, the same front end. So what I want to show you now is a couple of general tools that can attach to all these four different uh, data sources and give you uh, histograms or event counts or trace messages just to instrument a running system. So one example of a generic tool like this is argdist. This stands for argument distribution. It basically attaches to any function you specify and it can give you summaries over uh, its arguments, the arguments passed to that function. Now, there's some complexity here because uh, we do have to express a lot in the syntax. So in this case, we're attaching to a function called write, which is part of libc. That's the C over there. And the arguments for that function are a file descriptor, a buffer, and the number of bytes to write. That's just the user space write uh, syscall wrapper. And um, what we're doing is we filter for fd1 only, right? So only file descriptor one, and we ask argdist to produce event counts of the count um, argument. So that's what the different pieces of the syntax mean. And the result of this is just this little summary table that tells you, okay, so three times you had count equal 30, and two times you had count equal 18, and so on. So basically just an event frequency count of uh, right sizes to uh, file descriptor one. Another example, which gives you latency information with argdist, in this case, we're tracing a function in the kernel called VFS read. This is invoked for uh, file system reads, of course. It takes a file pointer, a buffer, and a count, but in this case, we want the latency of that function, so how long the, 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 the read actually took, and our filter here is latency over a million nanoseconds, which is one millisecond. So only aggregate uh, reads that took more than a millisecond to complete and build a histogram on the count of bytes, the number of bytes being read. So in the histogram, we only have uh, data for reads over a millisecond long, and we have statistics on the sizes of those reads. And so as you can see here, we had 20 reads where the number of bytes was anywhere from zero to one. So it's not necessarily the big reads that had a slow latency uh, in this case. Um, and again, we get this nice ASCII histogram. Another cute example of a tool is Trace, which um, doesn't produce histograms or event counts. It just gives you a means to insert a trace message, a log message, into all the BPF supported sources. So here's one nice example. Attached to the read line function in bash, and when that function returns, print out its return value as a string. Now read line, that's just the function bash uses to get your input uh, on, the, on the prompt. Um, so this just basically spies after everything typed into, into, into bash shells um, on the system 
and prints it out. You know, as the uh, event occurs, we print out the return value from read line. Um, another example over here with trace is uh, tracing a kernel trace point. So there is a trace point in the system called block RQ complete. This is called when a block IO request is completed. And uh, the format uh, for this trace point, the data you can get out of the trace point, is pretty extensive. So you have the device and the sector, errors, uh, read, write, whatever operation it was. So over here, we're tracing whenever that block RQ complete trace point is hit, and we're printing out the number of sectors. That's just uh, one of the values we get from the trace point. So that's just to illustrate we have different sources to which trace can attach. We can attach to user space functions, we can attach to kernel trace points, and yeah, there's this contrived syntax uh, that you have to figure out, but um, you can basically build these little one-liners uh, that give you nice insight into what the system is doing. And this is actually very useful for um, application tracing as well. So for example, in pthreads, we have uh, a trace point in user space called pthread create. This one's invoked every time uh, someone creates a pthread. So we could tell trace, well, trace pthread create and print out the third argument of that trace point. We don't have names here for non-interesting reasons, uh, but we have the number of arguments and their sizes. So what is printed here every time we create a thread is the start address of that thread. And with a little more post-processing work, we can convert that to a function. So whenever a thread is started on the system, uh, tell you which function that thread is going to run, which application function the thread is going to run, if we have uh, the debug info support. And a couple of examples from even higher level applications. So here's Node. And Node.js, if you compile it appropriately, has uh, static trace points in user mode as well. So here, we're tracing HTTP server request in Node. This is invoked whenever a node receives a, an HTTP request. And we're printing out uh, the HTTP method, the URL, uh, the source IP, and the port. Again, uh, node uh, doesn't have to know about um, trace attaching to it. And uh, finally, an example from the JVM. Uh, so this is open JDK, JDK 1.8, um, thread start and thread stop. Whenever these events occur, a thread is started or stopped, we print out the thread name and its ID. And this is built in, um, again, so we have uh, a nice trace of these events as they occur. And pretty much the same sources that I'm working with here with trace can also be used with argdist. So for example, how many requests am I getting where the method is get or post or give me a histogram of, uh, I don't know, uh, source uh, ports, right, calling my node HTTP server. Um, you could get all these things from the four different data sources I've mentioned using both of these tools. So that's just some of the built-in tools we have in BCC, and hopefully this shows some of the potential of what BPF programs can get you in terms of tracing and insight into the system. So I want to spend a few minutes talking about uh, building your own tools. You know, when the built-in ones don't suffice, or if you want to extend some of the tools you already have, or if you have a very specific problem for which you need to aggregate data from very, very specific data sources. So the general uh, story is this. You have uh, the various data sources, so uprobes, static trace points in user space, kernel trace points, and kprobes. And they all uh, provide information uh, to your BPF programs. So you write a BPF program with a bunch of little handler functions which are invoked when interesting events occur. These handlers run in kernel space and they have access to a set of data structures which I've mentioned. So you have uh, hash tables and histograms and a buffer that you can share with user space. So your BPF program that runs in the kernel can update those uh, data structures. And finally, in user space, you have a Python or Lua driver. This can also be just a C or C++ application. Uh, it's just that right now we only have nice wrappers for Python and Lua. And uh, these can access the data structures that your BPF program writes to. They can read and write these data structures. So for example, you could have a histogram which is filled by the BPF program. Your uh, user space Python tool would read and print that histogram and then clear it 
right? So you now have a clean slate for the next uh, time interval uh, which, you wanna, which you wanna trace. So that's the general story. And let me now show you a concrete example. Um, where's the, right. Here it is. Um, so this is a little program that uses uh, uh, trace points. And um, is this big enough? Someone from the back, raise your hand if it's not big enough. Not big enough, okay. So, how's this? A little better? Okay. Um, right, so uh, this is Python, and um, we're using the BCC module. By the way, uh, getting all these tools is pretty easy. I'll maybe have time for that in the end. And uh, you see there's two distinct parts here. So we have um, this text variable, which is just basically a bunch of embedded C code. And then towards the end, we have some Python as well. So if you look at the C code first, um, we declare a structure here that has the previous process ID and the next process ID. We're going to be tracing context switches between processes. So we have a data structure that stores the process being switched from and the process being switched to. And then we declare a hash table called switch counts, where the key is gonna be that structure. So the key is both the switched from and switched to process. And the value is U64, just a counter. And then we have this macro here called trace point probe. And we tell trace point probe, well, attach to a kernel trace point called sked switch, and when that trace point is hit, here's the code um, I want you to run. And this is just C again, but this C is compiled down to BPF instructions, loaded into the kernel, and attached to the trace point that we specify. And it updates this hash table, which we then read from Python. So here's how it updates it. Uh, first, maybe let me just uh, uh, quickly run TP list to show you uh, the sked switch trace point. So TP list is just basically a little info tool that, uh, for example, in this case, tells you what uh, arguments you can expect from the sked switch trace point. So it tells you here that you can expect the previous process ID, the next process ID, you also have uh, the com, the priority, and there's even a state over here. This tells you if the previous process was running or maybe it was idle and so on. Um, so these exact arguments, these fields really, are exactly what I can access in this C uh, function over here. So you see I initialize here uh, a structure switch T with the previous process ID and the next process ID from something called args. And this is just a magic argument that we inject in the process. And then I call lookup or init over here. Uh, on switch counts. So switch counts is a hash table, lookup in or in it just uh, uh, inserts a new value if it doesn't exist or returns the existing one. And then we just increment whatever value we have for that key. So, uh, you know, we are now tracing another switch from this process to that process, that's the key, and we have a counter of how many times that happened. Next, um, over here, we create an instance of the BPF uh, object. This is a Python object that takes our C program, compiles it down to uh, BPF instruction, and loads it into the kernel. And uh, in fact, there's also a step that's done automatically here, the attach part. So taking that BPF program and attaching that to the trace point, we take care of this in this example. Uh, it can also be done explicitly. And then that hash table called switch counts, we can just access that directly from Python. So again, directly, of course, is a very, uh, uh, is a very big simplification here. Um, there's basically uh, a lot of ping pong with the kernel every time you read the value from that hash table, but it, it looks like a hash table uh, to Python. And then, uh, you know, just every two seconds, we clear the screen, sort the data we currently have, and print out the top 10 items. Um, so here's what the result looks like. Oh, and that's, I'm gonna stop here. That's just the, um, uh, I asked for debug output. This is the generated C code. So the original C code was rewritten um, ever so slightly to produce uh, what you see on the right. So one example is that we generated this structure automatically. That's the trace point structure arguments. 
And also, when we called Luca for init, uh, it was actually translated to this mess over here, which is fine. And uh, even worse, I asked, uh, I asked BPF to print the uh, actual BPF instructions. So, you know, the instructions aren't very complicated, but you're not going to be writing that by hand. Even C is a lot more compelling. Um, okay, so now I'm going to run it for real. And uh, just every two seconds, we should expect uh, a summary of context switches aggregated by uh, source and target process. So uh, you see here that we had 40 switches from process 0 to 703, and also the same number of switches from 703 to 0. So that's probably some process waking up and then going idle, and we're switching out to process 0. Just a guess, but um, we could also get thread IDs, uh, process uh, comms, uh, make it a little more detailed. Um, so you see, BPF tools don't have to be very hard, but there will always be these two parts uh, the part that's uh, compiled down and executed in the kernel, and something in user space that talks to that uh, kernel uh, data plane. Um, in BCC, in this front end I'm showing you, uh, you use C and Python or Lua. You could also make the whole thing C. Uh, in the kernel tree, there's a bunch of samples where both the uh, BPF program and the driver are uh, C applications. Uh, so there's a lot of options. So the example I have here um, on the slides is a slightly different BPF program that counts memory allocations in the kernel by uh, the calling process. So the end result is uh, a lot similar to what I just showed you, just showing uh, the process ID, the number of allocations it performed, and the total size summary of these allocations. And uh, the source code for this, again, is a C program, a C component, where we have a handler function over here that we're going to attach to a kernel function for each, for each memory allocation. We have a hash table over here where we aggregate information about um, numbers of allocations and the total size of, this, of the allocations. Then we have the uh, Python side where I think the only interesting part compared to the example I showed you is that we explicitly call a function that attaches the handler we built here to a particular event in the kernel. In this case, it's a function called kmalloc. So we have attached functions like that for trace points, for k-probes, for user space trace points, and for uh, u-probes as well. All right, f the final thing I want to talk about before I leave a couple of minutes for questions is just deployment. So what do you have to do to get this thing running? So. First, um, I've mentioned this in the beginning, you need a, re a relatively new kernel. So uh, the tools based on probes should probably work on 4.1. Um, a lot of the tools we have right now in BCC work only on 4.4. And uh, the tools that rely on stack traces, that give you stack traces of what's happening, they need 4.6. Um, so you need a relatively uh, new kernel. Um, however, in terms of deployment of the actual um, front-end stuff, if you build Python tools, if you use existing Python tools, all you need is Python, and uh, 2.7 works okay, and uh, one library, libbcc, which the Python tools uh, talk to. That's the static C library uh, that loads BPF programs into the kernel for you and uh, does the, the communication uh, with user space. If you're building Lua tools, uh, we have a workflow where um, you can only deploy just one thing, just one statically linked binary called BCC Lua. Uh, this is work I haven't been uh, involved in, but it's extremely cool. Uh, basically, no uh, dynamic dependencies floating around. You don't need Lua itself. You don't need Lua JIT. It's all just compiled down to, uh, uh, to BCC Lua, and uh, you, you only have to distribute that single thing. Um, so there's not a lot required in terms of deployment, and this is in contrast to actual development because BCC uh, integrates uh, Clang and LLVM and LFUtils and a bunch of additional stuff you don't really want on uh, any production systems. 
So uh, just in summary, and then we'll have about three minutes for questions. Um, hopefully you see now the tracing, dynamic tracing, when you insert tracing into all kinds of surprising places, uh, can identify pretty interesting performance issues uh, that you often can't catch with uh, traditional tools, with average-based tools, statistics-based tools. Um, this makes uh, low overhead tracing possible for at least some of the targets that we have today, um, and production tracing, of course. And uh, hopefully this also positions BPF as the uh, agreed upon backend for a lot of additional front ends in the future. So you may disagree about the style of writing Python and C, but you still want BPF to be your backend. That's hopefully at least one thing we can agree on. Um, so I really appreciate you coming and we have about two minutes and 30 seconds. So please, if you have a couple of questions, I think I can take those. If you're sitting in. Thanks. Does running this require root, and is it possible to make it safe to use in shared environments? Okay, so uh, yeah, it does require root. Um, uh, pretty much everything except for uh, attaching BPF to sockets. So all the tracing stuff requires root. Um, that's just the answer, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, and so in terms of safety, I think one thing that's really missing today, and that's something that there's plans to address, is uh, accounting for BPF programs, right? So uh, get a list of all the programs running, what they're attached to, how much memory they're using. There's absolutely no insight into that today, uh, which is a problem. So we're, there's work on the kernel side to address that. Okay, thank you. Yep. Uh, did you use it already in some production system, like um, on continuously? Like, I mean, for debugging troubleshooting, I guess it's right. So, great, but yeah. Right. So uh, it's really so. Some of these tools are really hard to use in production systems because the production systems don't have new enough kernels. If you can afford to upgrade the kernel just to solve a particular issue, that's great. Or if you're always on the bleeding edge, that's also great. Um, so I have relatively few war stories to share. Uh, but one thing I can tell you is that uh, we have a memory leak tracing tool built in, which just collects allocation call stacks. And then it can show you which allocations you made and where that you didn't free. And I use that to solve a couple of memory leaks already, yes. Um, and uh, in contrast to, for example, Valgrind, it doesn't require, you know, recompilation. Uh, the overhead was not 100x. Um, so, so, yeah. What was your app? What's like, that? What was your runtime? The, the what? What was your runtime of your application in this case? Uh, it was a C++ application, yeah. I think we can do one more. No? Okay, I'll be here the whole day. Uh, I'm flying back tomorrow, but today you can definitely catch you in the hallways if you want anything, uh, talk about BPF. Um, really, thank you very much for coming. I hope you enjoy the rest of SRECon. Thanks.